We are talking about spiritual disciplines, how we can pursue a relationship with Christ. And this is a series called Honed. And this is a spiritual discipline that I think you will enjoy. I think this is good for us. So last week, Pastor Jason kind of set us up with the, the scenario of our noise in our head and our racing mind and a, a packed type of life, frenetic pace. And, and I am so susceptible to that. I think we're assigning this, this uh, message to me because Paul needs it. And I, I have a tendency to work hard and then play hard and then uh, think I'll sleep when I'm dead. At least I used to be more that way. And I'm, I'm gradually learning the, the benefit and the power and the joy of resting. And so uh, I, I hear this in our culture, a struggle with this. And when I ask people how you're doing, besides fine, which you know how much I like that, people often say, I'm just really busy, or I'm kind of tired. And then you lean in a little bit, and they tell you all of the things that they're trying to do, and some of them are mandatory, and some of them are optional. And I want to go back and talk about a scriptural principle, which is the discipline of rest. I, I want you to hear me say that, and I want us to say that as a, as a church body, that resting is spiritual, taking time to stop and to rest. And it started way back in the Garden of Eden, uh, the story of creation. It says God worked for six days, and then he rested. He stopped. In fact, the first word that's associated with is Sabbath, or in the Hebrew, it's Shabbat. And the idea is very, very simply you're working, and then you stop. And it says that God stopped. He rested. And there's a second word that's very similar to that in Genesis that I learned from the Bible Project this week, and it's the word nach. And it means to dwell or to settle or, if you will, just to be at home. And it's kind of a, if you look through the, the Genesis story, God worked to create. He then created man and woman, and it says then he rested, and then he settled them in the garden. And so it's, it's a picture of the rest of the Garden of Eden when they were in harmony with one another. The, the idea of naked and unashamed was a, a picture of them in, in openness and in love and in connection to each other. And then it says they walked and talked with God. So there's this spiritual dynamic to their time in the garden. And so these two pieces, the stopping working and then taking time to dwell or to settle. And so we need to understand how to do that. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory of it. And I think we're going to come at with some practical ideas for how do we learn to Sabbath well. And before that, to understand how we Sabbath well, we have to have a good theology of work. And I think this is important because an active, a right view of activity, a right view of work, a right view of what we are to do with our lives in a purposeful and meaningful way, that sets you up for a guilt-free, worshipful rest. And so the first idea about the theology of work is that we have to have an, a life that God has called us to is a life of serving. That when we entrust our lives to Christ, we are committing ourselves to serving Him and to serving others. That that's, that's actually a key theme all the way through the Scriptures. The Scriptures never, never focuses us on entertainment or idleness or laziness. And there are warnings about those things. It focuses us in our homes and in our jobs to be people who work and serve well. And one of the key verses for that is Colossians chapter 3. And he comes to the end of a whole list of roles and responsibilities of husbands and wives and parents and children, and he ends with slaves. And in our context, it would be for employees or people that are working. And for all of those roles, he says, whatever you do, whether you're a wife or a child or an employee or a slave, whatever you do, here's the first command, work at it with all your heart, with intensity and purpose. Not, in fact, he says specifically the verse before, don't do it just when people are watching. Do it even when nobody's watching because this is something that comes from inside of you. 
And then it says, you're not working for human masters since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. So here's a picture. If you're somebody that checks out groceries, what if Jesus is the one coming through your line? If you're somebody that does haircuts, what if you're serving Jesus in a physical, literal way? And I think he wants us to have that mindset that, that there is a spiritualness to work. In fact, I said this a couple of months ago. I think it's sad that in the church, we, we kind of put people on a pedestal if they do church work. If you're a pastor or an elder or if you're a missionary, then there's kind of this sense of, well, now that's spiritual work and, and all I do is cut trees or pull green chain or change diapers or something that doesn't seem like it's very important. And I believe that that is absolutely wrong, that our work has to come out of our hearts, which means your motive. And let me tell you the honest truth. You can do church work for selfish motives. You can do it to get your own way. You can do it to be impressive to other people. And you can do accounting. You can do salesmanship. You can do other things with the right heart to care for people, to serve the Lord. So this idea that work is, in fact, a spiritual discipline as well. And that we are to do all that we do for God's glory. Now, I'll tell you, one of the hidden secrets behind our busyness, behind my busyness, is that often we have a a little formula that says, how much I get done equals how much I'm worth. And that means when I don't accomplish a lot of things, I feel guilty and worthless. And when I get a bunch of stuff done, man, I love ticking off a bunch of boxes on my to-do list. Then I feel like, man, that was a good day. Maybe even deeper, I'm a good person. And so I I want you to think about the busyness that runs your life. There are so many things that we can do. And in fact, ironically, in our world, we have so many labor-saving and time-saving devices that we can zip from thing to thing. We stand in front of the microwave and go, come on, how long does it take? And it used to be that to get someplace, you had to walk or ride a horse, and it took time, and you had time to sort of think and reflect and, and, and be present. And we now jump in our car and jump to the next thing and jump to the next thing and jump to the next thing. And uh, I want us to think about why we are doing that, why we are working and why we are resting. So a good theology of work should lead us to a good theology of restoration. As I said, we're in a world where there is a lot of expectation. And some of it is work expectation, but a lot of it is competition that we put on ourselves of trying to look at everybody else's Facebook and do all the things that they're doing, and and we try to tell our story like we are really something special. But there's this drivenness to say, I've got to accomplish. I've got to to look good. I've got to make make a big difference somehow by my activity. And so let's go back and look at the backstory of where the idea of Sabbath came from. We already said it came out of Genesis, but the the next time it was really talked about strongly was when God was giving the Ten Commandments to Moses. And he said, one of the Ten Commandments is I want you to take the Sabbath, which was the seventh day of the week, and I want you to stop. And they got very, very specific. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of the why, but let me show you the verse where it all comes back to of what he says to the Israelites. Say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. So he says, this is a part of my covenant with the people of Israel, with the nation of Israel. Part of the covenant was circumcision, was the sacrifices in the tabernacle, was the, the idea that they had a special diet, things that they did do and didn't do. And then in addition, they had a day of the week, the Saturday, from Friday night till Saturday night was holy time. And you couldn't make a fire, you couldn't walk too far. They had very clear restrictions on what Sabbath meant. Now, it's kind of interesting if you were to come with me to Israel today, they have the, the same idea, especially of the observant Jews, And it's very specific. In the evening when you can see three stars in the sky, 
And they publish it in their paper and everything. This is when sundown is. From that time on, Saturday, or Friday night till all the end of Saturday, you are not to do any work. And work is defined extremely specifically. In fact, I, I often warn our groups, when you stay in an Israeli motel, don't take the, the uh, elevator that says Sabbath elevator. You think, what's the difference? You'll have a regular elevator and a Sabbath elevator. Well, they make a switch in the settings when it comes to Friday night. And it doesn't matter if it's a 10-story or a 20-story that you can't get into the elevator and push a button because pushing the button would trigger an electric motor and that's work. So the Sabbath elevators for the devout, they stop at the first floor and open the doors. And then they close and they stop at the second floor and then they open the doors. And if you are on the second floor trying to get to the first, you may have to go all the way up to the 10th and all the way back down. You might get old before you get there. But the, the funny idea is that we just have to be so, so careful not to work. And, and I think they're observing the details and many have lost the heart of it. So the heart of Sabbath was expressed in those details you have to keep my Sabbath. But I want you to see the deeper part here. He says, this will be a sign between me and you. Now, who is the you? Good Bible study method says, is this talking to me? Well, no, if you read carefully, he's talking to the nation of Israel. A little later, he says, it's a covenant between you and me forever. And there are people today who say, we should observe the Sabbath we should keep Saturday special and sacred. We should worship on that day. We should be just like the Jews. But in Acts chapter 15, there was a letter that said what of the Old Testament laws and Old Testament customs the Gentiles were supposed to keep. And the Sabbath isn't in there and the circumcision isn't in there and the sacrifices are not in there because Christ has changed the covenant and we are in a new covenant. But that, that picture of being obedient to the Sabbath a lot of Christians grabbed onto that, and, and sometimes they apply it to Sunday. And my wife grew up in a home where the youth group would play soccer on Sunday afternoon, but she couldn't play soccer because that was too much work. But she could ride her bike into youth group because that was a good purpose, and her mom could knit, but she couldn't sew. And she said, I was so confused with all these nitpicky little rules, and I never really got the why. I never really understood what was on behind that. So... This picture that started in Genesis was a part of the covenant relationship of God and Israel. And the, the important point for you and I is to realize not only was that so that they would be a covenant people, they were, they were supposed to be an example culture that the rest of the world would look at and say, wow, they're following God and look at what's happening in that kingdom. I want to know who that God is, that they were to, to show God as holy as wonderful to the, to the culture around. And so that purpose for Israel, listen carefully, we don't keep a Sabbath because Jesus is our spiritual Sabbath. Now that is a big, that is a big statement, so let me explain that for you. Sabbath was not only a specific thing for the nation of Israel as a part of that covenant. In many ways, it was also like a lot of things in the Old Testament, it was, a, it was an arrow pointing us to Jesus. And in Hebrews, the writer to Hebrews explains this to Jewish people who've all their life not only done the Sabbath, but they've done the sacrifices and the diets and all the things to try to be pleasing to a holy God. And what he says is beautiful for you and me. He says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. So, very simply, he says, God worked and then God rested because his work was done. And Jesus came to earth and he lived on our planet and he, he lived a perfect life in a sinful world. And he gave his life as a sacrifice, like the Old Testament sacrifices, only this is the one sacrifice for all time. And then he rose from the dead to show us that it worked and that he was alive and that he is alive. And he says that because of what Jesus has done, 
I don't have to try to pay for my own sin. I don't have to try to work to please God. I don't have to try to, to accomplish salvation for myself. In fact, I think this is a powerful picture of the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant was trying to show my love for God by obeying all the rules. And in the New Testament, he talks about when we come to faith in Christ, it's like we were dead. And it's not this gradual, I add more good things to my resume and, and I lower my sin count. It's that I was dead and Christ comes in and because he has worked, I don't have to. Now that doesn't mean, go back to the theology of work, it doesn't mean I'm inactive and lazy. What it means is I'm not trying to work for my own salvation. I'm not trying to somehow pay for my sins. I'm not trying to somehow make an angry God happy. Now he says that when we come, that there's a Sabbath rest. That there are three kinds of people. There are people who say, I don't care about God or his righteousness. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to do my own thing. And then there's a large group of people who say, I want to try to be a good person and I'm going to work at it in my own way. But the pressure is all on me. And then there's a third group who are the followers of Jesus. And we have to say, I can't do it. I can't make myself holy. I can't forgive my sins. I can't even really improve my moral score very much. And so instead, I'm going to have faith in Jesus. I'm going to trust him. And I am going to lean into the work that he's done. And then you can rest in a Sabbath rest. Not just taking one day a week off, but having an understanding of a life in Christ because of that. And I just want to lean in here for a moment. There's a lot of people in the second category. When I say, how is your relationship with Christ? Or are you a follower of Jesus? And, and sometimes I get the reaction, I'm working at it. I think, oh, that's too bad. That we're still trying to work at it. When it's not about working harder, it's about believing in what Jesus has done and actually resting in that. That we are actually trusting his work instead of our own. And maybe you need that word today. Maybe you've even been coming to church as part of your moral improvement program. And you realize that you've never really said, I can't do it myself. I'm going to trust Jesus. I'm going to let him be my Sabbath rest. And let me tell you, if that's where you are today, that's the best decision you can make. And I would hope you would stop even right now in the sermon and just pray that God would enter into your life and give you rest. And in, in Matthew 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You see, that's the kind of rest that we really need. Not just a ceasing of activity, but of dwelling with and letting Christ dwell in us. So, that's the, the, the spiritual picture behind the story of Sabbath. But let me go on for where we are today. I think we still need a regular time of restoration. We need a Sabbath. There's a practical side. You can't keep working seven days a week and hope that somehow it'll all work out fine, that you'll, be, you'll, you'll sleep when you're dead. In fact, there, there was a, uh, a wife that was very concerned about her pastor husband because he was driven in ministry and he would work and work and take phone calls at all hours of the night and, and he was just seven days a week, and his wife could see he was burning out, and she could see that he was frustrated. And so there was a, a famous speaker, pastor, came named Howard Hendricks, and, and the wife caught him in a moment when she, she was away from her husband, and she explained the problem. And, uh, and Howard Hendricks said, no worries, I'll take care of it. And he had kind of a, a brusque, <laughs> wonderful style. And so when the pastor was driving him back to the airport, he said to the pastor, that was great being at your church this weekend. I enjoyed that. He said, I noticed all week long you didn't smoke a single cigarette. <laughs> the pastor kind of looked at him in funny. He said, why, why would that surprise you that I'm not smoking a cigarette? He's, how he said, why don't you smoke a cigarette? Why don't you do that? He said, well, the Bible teaches us that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that we're to steward it and take care of it and it wouldn't be wise to do that with my body. And then Howie then said, then how come you're not sleeping and you're not taking a day of rest and you're not taking care of your body? You're not an angel, man. 
<laughs> he, he kind of read him the riot act and the guy got the point that how we care for our body involves working as unto the Lord diligently, but then stopping as unto the Lord and doing that also as an act of worship. And in Mark chapter 2, the Holy Son of God was getting in trouble again for breaking the Sabbath. They had so many little rules that he was messing up and they were calling him on it. And he clarifies, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. (laughs) He was saying, I made the rule, I can break it if I want to. But even deeper, he was saying, the purpose of Sabbath was because we need it. And so I want us to take for just a moment and say, how do, how do you learn to Sabbath? How do you restore that we live in a world that's frenetic and our minds are busy and, and much of that is kind of tearing at our soul? And how do you get renewal? How do you come back to the place where you actually are enjoying your life again? And I want to tell you, this is a spiritual discipline. I like the word restore because in my mind, I remember the first time I ever did a furniture restoration. I was in high school and got an old bureau. It kind of looked like this, actually. And, and uh, you strip the paint off of it, and then you sand it down, and then you, I oiled it and made it look all beautiful. And it was just a fun process, but it was a slow and intentional process. And maybe you don't relate to furniture. Maybe you relate to cars. And I'm amazed as I've watched guys take old, junky, rusty, half beaten up pieces and, and they work and work and work and work at it, but they get to a place where it is restored and renewed. And so I want you to think through with me the complex question of how do I Sabbath? And I want to say right up front, the answer may be slightly different for each of us. If you are single, it's different. If you are a young family with a bunch of kids running around and you, both of you work at different times and you feel like there's no way we can Sabbath. You're going to have to find your own rhythm of it when you are retired, when you are older, when your kids are not in your home. Um, a lot of retirees tell me I'm as busy or busier now than I ever was. I think, uh, whose fault is that? <laughs> it's like, you're not even getting paid for it now. Why are you so driven? And so I want us to back to that moment where we say, what would it look like if a regular part of my week involved stopping and resting? So let me tell you what has to be a part of, if you're going to learn the Sabbath, it has to be, first of all, rest. So that means that you have to stop what you are normally doing. It also means there should be no side hustles. It means we should be careful of the tendency we have to entertain ourselves to death. Sometimes our idea, our only idea of rest is just sit and watch TV or play on our phones or iPads. And, and there can be some entertainment part of rest, but that's not the primary feature of it. There has to be a time when we actually just slow everything down. It's one of the process of learning how to live in a less stressed way. And we have to come to a place where we say, okay, I'm going to stop. One of our staff, Heather, showed me a a post she saw this week. It was posted by somebody who was a therapist and it says, one of the most damaging parts of the hustle culture is that it prevents us from showing up, appreciating, and being present with our current version of life. And Heather said, isn't that a great description of what Sabbath is supposed to be? To stop what we're doing, to enjoy where we are. Sometimes we're so busy trying to get to the next step that we don't enjoy where we are. Uh, I think we wish our lives away. Sometimes we're so busy trying to have enough entertainment on the weekend that we come back to the week exhausted and strung out and tired. So rest, including good sleep, is a part of Sabbath. And then another part of it is an intentional focus on God. Now, Sabbath is worship. Stopping and resting, God says, that's something that we, we please Him as we work and, and try to work as unto the Lord. We also please Him, not, not to please Him like make our salvation, but 
We, he enjoys that we stop and rest and spend time with him. And you think of the Garden of Eden picture. Adam and Eve spent time together. They were authentic, naked and unashamed with each other. And they spent time walking and talking with God. So we need to get as much of that as we can. And quite often it has to be an intentional, from this point to this point, we are not working. And we are going to take some time off from our normal schedule. Now, rest is different for different people. Somebody who works in an office all week may find going out and chopping wood or using a chainsaw or doing something like that is restful. Some people find hobbies very restful. Some people find board games as a family very restful. The third part of that, which would be in every Sabbath, is there should be some deepening of relationships. Not only should there be a God focus, and in fact, that's one of the things we encourage you to come on a weekend to a, to a church service or to watch online if you can't, but the idea is to take some time and set it out for filling my heart spiritually, being involved in worship, getting an active part of that. But, but another part of coming to church is making friends, seeing people that maybe are in need, welcoming new people, Finding somebody that maybe you can disciple and pour into. Just getting and giving hugs is a great piece of that. So that we need time off where we actually rest our minds and our hearts and and our bodies. But it has to have a spiritual focus, at least as a part of that. And last week, Pastor Jason talked about silence and solitude. And as I listen to people and I hear what restores them, there's a lot of people that, that go on hikes in the woods that, that are able to get away and, and do some things like fishing or, or even hunting or do looking for mushrooms or, or finding agates. Or there are different ways in which you can do something that is not your normal routine. It's slowing down. It's enjoying. And generally, a key part of that is enjoying key relationships. And, and can we be just honest? There are some relationships that fill my cup up and restore me, and there are some that are just dead shorts on the battery. And part of Sabbath is being around people that you can pour into and they can pour into you. And life groups are a big starter of that function in our lives. So let me, let me back this up and just talk about how this all works. We're not wanting to add more to your schedule. We're not wanting to say, here's another big burden. We're trying to talk about the things that have been spiritual focus points for believers for thousands of years in order to help you pursue intimacy with Christ and pursue a, a growing relationship with Christ. And we've talked about reading the Bible and praying. We've talked about generosity with our finances. We've talked about solitude and, and taking time to, to have silence and solitude. We were, we were talking this weekend about Arranging your weekly schedule so that you actually stop and take time and Sabbath is unto the Lord. We have a couple more we're going to talk about, but you say, I don't have time to do all those. Well, (laughs) if you set aside time for Sabbath, you will have some time. If you think about it, we're actually trying to give you a gift of some time and to make it a a thing that replenishes your family, replenishes your relationship and replenishes your life with Christ. Then, as your soul unravels all week long, you have a time for the Lord to knit it back together and to make, make you more peaceful, more holy, and hopefully that makes you also more productive when you actually go back to work. So, I don't want you to hear this is one more thing you got to do. I want you to hear it's a change of mindset and a change of lifestyle that actually takes seeking after God and puts it into my weekly schedule. A daily quiet time, a weekly Sabbath, and perhaps a quarterly time to review my life and to evaluate. And if you do those things, I think you will find yourself to be more at rest, more peaceful, the things that you probably really want, but are too busy to seek for. So I hope that's helpful. I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors, and maybe you can talk specifically about how you Sabbath as a way to help us all. Thanks.